As I've made abundantly clear in the past, I'm a big fan of kart racers. And while I definitely love the head honchos of the genre, I also like giving some of the lesser known stuff a fair chance, which I did in video form just a few months ago. There was definitely some bad stuff among the batch, but there were also some genuine hidden gems in there too, which made for a pleasant surprise. And hey, since I had a fun time making that video, and many of you had a fun time watching that video, I decided to have another go at it, because as I found out, there's a lot more of these out there beyond the ones I covered. So yeah, we're going at this again. I've got six more obscure kart racers here today, and we're going to be giving them a look to see if there's any diamonds in the rough, or if they're all just rough. Though to make things interesting, I decided to crack open my wallet this time. All the games I played in the last obscure kart racers video were ones I was already familiar with, but this time only two of the six I'll be looking at I've played before. The other ones I'm playing for the first time specifically for the sake of this video. Not sure if this is a bad sign or not of what's to come, but I suppose we'll let time tell that one. So to start things off, we're going to take a look at a little something called Mod Nation Racers. I imagine some of you may remember this game, but to those who don't, Mod Nation Racers was a PlayStation exclusive kart racer released on the PS3 in 2010, with Sony themselves publishing it. Not sure if this was their attempt to get a piece of Nintendo's pie they had baked with Mark or Wii's recent success, but it's entirely possible. Though the big selling point of Mod Nation Racers was that, much like 2008's Little Big Planet, there was a huge emphasis on user-generated content, which could also be shared online for others to download. On paper, pretty solid concept, but given the series went on to get only one other game on the PlayStation Vita, it definitely didn't seem to click as well as Little Big Planet did. Not helped by the fact that literally two years later, the same developers put out a Little Big Planet kart racer, making Mod Asian Racers even less relevant. Oops. Now, I've never owned a PS3, so I've never actually played the PS3 version of Mod Nation Racers. However, there was also a port on PSP, which I did own. Actually, funny story, I distinctly remember this being the free game I got from Sony as a compensation gift after that massive PSN data breach in 2011. Yeah, anyone remember that disaster? That said, while I do remember liking this game back in the day, I also haven't touched it in years, so let's see how well it holds up. So the game's story focuses on a silent pro tag named... Well, Tag, a graffiti artist who decides to compete in the Mod Nation Racing Championship, with support from his mother, who runs a car paint shop, and Tag's crew chief named... Er, chief, who was a former MRC racer himself. Although he's a rookie, he quickly gains a following, and even gets the attention of his uncle Richard, who tries to get him to become a sponsor for his largely disliked motor company, even going so far as to blow up Tag's car and put Chief in a coma to convince Tag to sign a contract. What's with these E-rated kart racers and having attempted murder as plot points? Beyond that little tidbit though, the story just goes through the notions of a rookie to champion racing plotline. Mon Nation Racers clearly isn't out to tell a compelling story, but rather focuses a fair bit more on the comedy, most notably with MRC sees commentators Biff and Gary. And while I probably found this all funnier at a younger age, most of the humor didn't really hit its mark for me in my recent playthrough. So much like LEGO Racers and My Sims Racing, games I talked about in my last Obscure Kart Racers video, you're given the ability to create your own racer and car. And the options you're given for both of these are honestly super vast, to the point that you don't even need matching eyes on your racer. There's definitely a lot of room for creative freedom with the racer especially, though you do need to play a lot of the career mode before you start unlocking the really good stuff. Now admittedly, despite this, I didn't enjoy making my racer here as much as I did with LEGO Racers or even My Sims Racing, despite the larger pool of options. But that's largely due to the fact that I'm not really a fan of how Mod Nation Racers' characters look. It's like the game's trying to go for a cooler equivalent to the Sackboys from Little Big Planet, but they kind of look more like collectible figurines you'd find at a game store, and more of the Funko Pop kind rather than the Nendoroid kind. That said, I did make the most out of what I had. At the start of my playthrough, I made a fellow named Daryl, but once I had the pieces unlocked, I brought back an old legend from the LEGO Racers days. That's right! Jebediah is back behind the wheel! Though easily the best aspect of Mod Nation Racers' creation tools is that you're able to make your own race tracks. Now of course, the PSP version doesn't quite have as many tools at your disposal as the PS3 version, but this still is a really cool feature. And again, or at least before the servers went down, you were able to share this content online for others to download. Granted, I don't think it was quite as impressive as in Little Big Plant's case, given the kind of crazy things people were able to make with such simple on the outside tools, but nevertheless, it was a really standout feature on Mod Nation Racers' play compared to other kart racers. Can't quite say the same about the gameplay though. Now this isn't to say Mod Nation Racers is a bad game per se, more so that its gameplay is just kind of... Nah. Ironically for a game with a heavy emphasis on creativity, this is about as standard of a kart racer as you can get. And while this isn't inherently a bad thing, it's not helped by the fact that, at least with the PSP version, it doesn't control particularly well. I found the steering to be oddly slippery, even when drifting, and that led to a bunch of wall hitting and off-road traversing that I would have been able to avoid with a bit better traction. I'm not sure if this is a problem in the PS3 version as well, but again, in the PSP version at least, it's a problem I had. On top of that, there is very little clarity when it comes to the power-ups. 
An important aspect of a kart racer that I think some overlook is how easily understandable power-up functionality is. Banana peel in Mario Kart, missile in CTR, self-explanatory. And even with their power-ups that may not immediately communicate their functionality through their icons, their icons are still distinct from one another, so that once you've used the power-up, you know what to expect from it in the future. Green Shell, I have an offensive projectile. Aku Aku Mask, I'm gonna be invincible. Stuff like that. Mod Nation Racers doesn't really have that for most of its power-ups, with many of their icons being really hard to decipher what they're even supposed to be, and with such vague idea of how they function that you're not gonna remember what they do the next time you get them. Because of this, I found it harder to strategize with power-ups, as I'd often forget what some of them even do, or which icon equaled which power-up. The game has a boost system similar to My Sims Racing's, with your meter filling up from doing stuff like drifting, hitting opponents with power-ups, spinning during jumps, all that. But there's also some really strange maneuvers the game includes as a means to gain boost, like side-swapping opponents. You do this by pushing up on the D-pad, what? And oftentimes it doesn't even work. Or a stomp attack you can do by pressing down on the D-pad as you're about to land from a jump. An attack that will only ever work if someone's right next to you as you land, which is not very often. I found myself almost never doing these unless a mission in career mode required me to. They felt kind of pointless. The one on the topic of the boost meter, throughout races, Chief will provide remarks and tips about your performance. And if at any point you have some boost and you're not using it for whatever reason, he'll be quick to call you out. Same goes with power-ups. It doesn't matter if you're strategically holding on to it, he'll be sure to nag you about not using it if you don't use it pretty much right away. What is this? The slow motion replay? Fire up that boost. In case you didn't notice, that boost is full. Time to use it. You like it back there, Sparkles? Boost already! You know what would help in this situation? Weapon! So of course, this is assuming you even hear Chief, because while the game's soundtrack and voice acting are fine, its sound balancing is really bad. Like, Shrek treasure hunt levels of bad at some points. But regardless of that, Chief's remarks don't take long to get annoying. I get I'm a rookie and all, but please stop babying me. So yeah, like I said, Mod Nation races on PSP is just meh overall. The creation aspects are quite solid, don't get me wrong, but I feel like the gameplay isn't really able to hold the game up enough to make those creation aspects as worthwhile as they could be. I imagine the PS3 version's at least a bit better in these regards, but on PSP, yeah, I wasn't a big fan. Well, that was kind of an unfortunate note to start off on. Oh well, I want to stay optimistic. Maybe the next game will be better. Ah, crap. Here we've got Nickelodeon Kart Racers, a bit of a more recent title, having only come out two years ago. Now, admittedly, this one may be a bit more on the edge of being considered obscure, especially since it's getting a sequel later this year, but given how little fanfare I saw this game get since its release, I felt it counted. I snagged this one on the Switch eShop during a sale not too long ago, grabbing it at only $15 compared to its usual $40. But as I was quick to find out, that still may have been too much. So first things first, when you think Nickelodeon, what kind of shows come to mind? Probably a lot. Nickelodeon's got a large selection of cartoons under its belt, many of which are quite beloved. So with that in mind, you'd think a kart racer crossover for this company would have a pretty solid lineup of characters. A safe assumption to make, but a very wrong one. Here's the roster for Nickelodeon kart racers. No, I'm not pulling your leg, there's no hidden characters or anything. All there is here, to represent several decades worth of beloved TV animation, are 12 characters from a total of four shows. Three SpongeBob characters, three Rugrats characters, two Hey Arnold characters, and all four of the Ninja Turtles, characters that Nickelodeon didn't even make. They just own the current rights to them. For such a legendary lineup of shows in their catalog, this character roster is honestly kind of pathetic. But believe it or not, once we enter gameplay, that becomes one of the least notable problems. Because to put it bluntly, this game's bad. And we're not just talking like, the usual boring bad, I'm more so meaning that it straight up feels unfinished. Like the publisher had it shipped when it was still an alpha. For example, you thought that roster lineup was bad enough as is? Well what if I told you that none of them talk? Or rather that they only talk in speech bubbles? That's right, there's absolutely no voice acting. Not sure if this was a budgeting issue, or the devs couldn't find the right time to get the voice actors in the booth, or if it was just a deliberate decision to not include any. But because of this, a lot of these races feel utterly lifeless, with nothing audible coming out of these otherwise talkative characters. And that's not all that makes this game feel that way. Sound effects and particle effects are very minimal, except for the slime. You will see and hear a lot of slime in this game because, hey, it's Nickelodeon. And most of the characters' animations often feel overly simplistic. Again, it generally feels like an early build rather than a $40 game from two years ago. And as for the gameplay itself, well, it's basically Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. From the way starting boosts work, to your car transforming into a boat or plane in specific sections of tracks. The key difference, though, is that All-Stars Racing Transformed is a good game. The big problem with the gameplay, aside from everything I've already brought up, is the controls. Steering feels incredibly stiff, and drifting somehow feels even 
and stiffer, so you never feel like you have much freedom of movement. And that's before you enter boat form, where drifting is practically non-existent. On top of that, this game's infected with one of the worst diseases that kart racers are able to suffer from, rubber band AI. And while it's not quite as brutal as some of the other examples you're going to be seeing later on, it's still pretty bad. It does not take long for AI drivers to catch up with you, even when you're doing everything as perfectly as you can. And this is before mentioning some of the odd alternative challenges thrown to this game's Grand Prix mode, which in any other kart racer is just win the races. There's the occasional elimination race, which, yeah, okay, that's common in kart racers. But then there's this really bizarre type of race where you have to drive on the side of the road that these giant arrows are pointing at. And if you don't, you get eliminated. It's a really odd gimmick, and it didn't take long to get annoying between the poor placement of these arrows and the previously mentioned controls. Also, every once in a while, I got put into this victory lap challenge, where I started racing on the track I was just on, only for the race to end after hitting a few treasure chests. You unlock coins and card upgrades from this, oh yeah, there's a card upgrade system, but I was just left confused by this. Also, did I mention there's a lot of slime in this game? Hope you like the look of radioactive green and the constant sound of... Ugh, I'm gonna be honest, that noise is kinda gross. And then the winner of a Grand Prix gets coated in it while on the podium. I think I've had enough Nickelodeon kart racing for one lifetime. To be honest, I kinda wish this game's development story was public knowledge, because with the way it turned out, I'm almost certain something was going on behind the scenes. You don't tend to make a Nickelodeon game and deliberately choose not to have any voice acting, or to release it in, again, what looks like an alpha state. And while it's definitely not the worst kart racer I've played, far from it, it's one of the dullest I've ever played. Though I am curious to see how things change with its upcoming sequel. It's already got a notable upgrade with the character roster at the very least. Seriously, look at all these shows being represented! And also a teen pop star for some reason. Anyway, I feel like I need to cleanse my system after that. So what do you say we jump from one licensed kart racer I hadn't played prior to making this video, to another licensed kart racer I hadn't played prior to making this video? Minus three console generations. This here is Toy Story Racer, a PS1 kart racer released in 2001. It was developed by Traveler's Tales, a company then at the time known for making some pretty quality Pixar tying games. Though what I do find interesting about this game in comparison is that it wasn't necessarily a tie-in to a specific movie. It came out two years after Toy Story 2, with the next film not coming out for another nine years, but interestingly didn't feature anything from Toy Story 2. All this game's content is entirely based on the original movie, from 1995. It does make me curious to what went on behind the scenes with this game as well. Was it supposed to come out closer to the first film's release? Was there supposed to be Toy Story 2 content that got cut for whatever reason? Or was this a case where Traveler's Tales finally had the opportunity to make something without strict creative demands from the publisher and made the game how they wanted to make it? I'm honestly not sure what the answer is, but I do find it fascinating. And that fascination actually doesn't stop there. The gameplay of Toy Story Racer is unlike any other kart racer I've ever played, and I mean that in a good way. See, structurally, it's very much like your average kart racer but control-wise, it goes for something completely different. Every character in the game drives in an RC car, or in the case of RC, is an RC car. And the controls reflect that a lot more than I was expecting. The steering feels less like a kart racer kart and more like, well, an RC car. So turning is a lot tighter and quicker, allowing you to very easily take even the sharpest turns. It took me a little bit to get used to it, but yeah, it felt great. This unique take on gameplay is also reflected in the track design. Instead of the tracks being designed to be like actual race tracks, each of the stages are just ordinary areas, driving through rooms of houses, across neighborhood yards. It's like it's trying to replicate the feeling of playing with an RC car in real life racing it around everyday locations, which is incredibly fitting given the whole premise of Toy Story as a series. And it's all executed super well, making for a very bouncy, fun kart racer. Though with that in mind, it does make me wonder, since RC is sentient, does that mean that the RC cars being used by all the other characters are sentient as well? If so, then the implications of the creepy spider baby toy are even worse, because it looks like a parasite having latched onto a poor RC car as its host. Speaking of characters, I'm honestly really surprised at how solid of a roster this game has, given it's based off just the first movie. Now granted, it does have to stretch with a few choices, like with this wrestler toy that was in like, what, three scenes in the original movie? But it does have a pretty strong lineup overall, and I do really like that RC's his own playable character, it's an oddly cute touch. The track up strong in that regard as well, on a related note, taking you through pretty much every location from the movie and beyond. I'm not apologizing for that. Between all this and an unbelievably catchy soundtrack, I'm sure Kid Me would have loved this game. Or get really frustrated because this game's definitely not easy. If I did have one issue with this game, it's that the single player mode is a bit on the repetitive side. Each character essentially has their own challenge tower, adding to a total of 200 challenges. Man, there's not a ton of variety in them. Don't get me wrong, they're fun challenges for the most part, but it doesn't take long before you start seeing challenges repeat. And when it's across 200 of them, it's hard to stay enthusiastic about every single one. Fortunately, there's a cheat code that allows you to clear challenges without actually doing them, which I admittedly did for a fair amount of challenges, both due to the repetitive 
competitiveness and to unlock all the characters. I only have a bit of shame in doing this. But yeah, overall, this was a fun game. Unique fun gameplay, really imaginative despite the possibly self-imposed limitations, can't complain. Though now I'm trying to imagine a modern equivalent of this game with stuff from all the movies and spin-off stuff. I'd pay good money for a game like that. Actually, funny that I mentioned money, because this next game I've got here I got for 52 cents. I'm not joking. It was on sale on the Switch eShop for $1.25, and with the use of eShop Gold Points, I got the game's price down to 52 cents. And what game did I manage to snag at such a generous price? Well, none other than All-Star Fruit Racing. Yeah. All-Star Fruit Racing. What, never heard of it? Actually, wait, it wouldn't be in this video if people did. This game was the first title developed by a studio known as 3D Clouds, and came out only a few years ago on every major platform. I had no idea what to expect going in, but hey, it's got a mostly positive on Steam, so hopefully it turns out well. And if it doesn't, well, at least it wasn't expensive. So as you can tell by the title, this game's got a very large fruit motif. Each of the characters, who I personally wouldn't describe as all-star, I have no idea who any of these are, are themed off a specific fruit, giant fruit are all throughout the racetrack environments, and the loading screens give fruit-related facts. I don't know about you, but I think someone in the dev team really likes fruit. Fruit even carries into the gameplay through the power-up system, which I'll go into in a moment. But yeah, first impressions, this game doesn't look too bad. The environments are vibrant, there's a pretty large character roster, and you're even able to customize your cart with quite a few options, including your horn. Yay! That said, while everything looks pretty alright at the start, once you get into gameplay, it gets rough. Really rough. The controls are the first issue here. Steering feels stiff, especially when drifting. Oh hey, that sounds familiar. Leading to you veering off-road quite often, which is made an even larger issue by two other factors, the speed and the AI. As in, this game's quite slow, and its AI's rubber bands are quite stretchy. So playing catch-up when you unintentionally drift off into the dirt can sometimes be borderline impossible. The only way you're getting any speed built up is either through drifting, which again, is stiff, speed panels, which are not very common, and through speed power-ups, which brings us to the interesting power-up system. So while some races use a traditional item pickup system, some instead have you pick up fruit juice to fill up this juicer thing? When a part of the juicer thing is full, you'll have a power-up at your disposal. But by filling up another part of the juicer thing, you'll create a different power-up, allowing you to mix and match the four different types of juices to make different power-ups. And when you have all four juicer things full, you'll get your character's special attack. You're also able to disconnect parts of the juicer thing with the face buttons, keeping that part out of the mix and allowing you to save it for a later usage. Now on paper, this is actually a pretty unique concept for power-up usage in a kart racer. But in execution, it's not very good. What juices represent what types of power-ups and what combinations will equal what, you're never going to remember any of them. Not helped by poor visual clarity with some of the power-up icons, which makes strategizing a lot harder to do. Also, since the face buttons are used to connect and disconnect the juice of things, and your triggers are for accelerating and drifting, how to use power-ups, you ask? You press into the right stick, like a button. You can probably imagine how uncomfortable it is to do this to use power-ups, but if not... Well, it's uncomfortable to do this to use power-ups. On top of that, the track design honestly isn't too strong. For a game called All-Star Fruit Racing, the tracks visually really play it safe with the fruit motif, usually just placing giant fruit in the environment. The only exception I can think of is this track that takes place inside a giant cracked coconut. But beyond that, just a bunch of fruit sitting next to the road. The tracks also tend to be really narrow, which doesn't go well with the stiff steering. And all that combined with the slow sense of speed, it does not take long for this game to feel like a slog. Also, I get that this was their first game, so I don't want to be too harsh about optimization issues, but this game's not the most stable in that regard. The frame rate often chugs a lot, and while playing online with some friends, we came across some... interesting glitches. Also, yes, this game has online, and yes, I got some of my friends, my buddies PJ and Robin, to go on this ride with me. They both didn't like it. There's definitely some interesting ideas present in All-Star Fruit Racing, and with more time in the oven, I think this game could have been quite good. But as it stands, I wasn't a fan of this one. That said, I do hope that 3D Clouds has been able to continue on from this, improve their craft, and make something truly special. Wait, what? They made the next game I'm looking at? Oh, what a funny coincidence. Thank you, voice I've never heard before. Alright then, let's see what you've got for us now, 3D Clouds. I'm sorry, what? 
For those who are unaware, like I was when I first heard about this game, Race with Ryan is a very recently released kart racer based off the YouTube kids channel, Ryan's World. Now I had never heard of this channel before, so I found it weird for there to be a video game based off of it, but once looking further into it, I found out this channel is huge. Like, 25 million subscribers huge. How I never heard of this before, now knowing all this, is completely beyond me. So yeah, a kart racer based off an internet child celebrity. That alone's already sounding a bit sketchy if you ask me. And like I said before, this was developed by 3D Clouds. So while I want to be optimistic about this game, I don't have a good feeling about this one. Fortunately, I didn't actually have to buy this one. A friend of mine ended up buying and mailing me a PS4 copy. If you're watching this, Jeremy, I owe you big time. So we start off with this relatively quiet opening montage, and then all of a sudden... Welcome to Race with Ryan! This is what I get for not liking All-Star Fruit Racing, isn't it? Ow, my ears hurt. Also, it doesn't take long at all for the target demographic of this game to become apparent. Aside from the obvious reason, with the source material and all, Ryan has something to say about literally everything you highlight on any of the menus. Choosing a character, choosing a track, choosing a difficulty, choosing a main menu option. You'll be hearing Ryan's voice a lot in this game. Though on that note, here's something kind of funny I discovered. When highlighting over a character or track that was released in the DLC expansion, yes, there was a DLC expansion, you can really tell they had Ryan's lines recorded somewhere completely differently. Are you ready for treasure, I? Island? Don't freeze on this track! Also, whenever playing on a mode with AI drivers, you'll get to hear remarks from Ryan and other characters from the Ryan's World universe before and after a race. Having never watched a Ryan's World video to this day, I have no idea who any of these characters are, so I can only go off these cutscenes to determine my thoughts on them. And so far... That was a catastrophe! Brah, 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 brah. Buzz off! Buzz off! Buzz off! I think I'll get back to you on that one. Though to give credit where credit's due, I do think the idea of all these characters playing the game in a group chat together like this is kinda charming. At the very least, it seems like Ryan's having fun with his bits. They're silly, yeah, but he's also a kid, I can't blame him for it. But now let's talk about the game itself, the kart racing stuff and all. And you know what? I'm just gonna get straight to the point. This is gonna rank high in the weirdest sentences I've ever said for a video, but believe it or not, Race with Ryan somehow isn't bad. Now to clarify, I wouldn't say it's necessarily great, but it's honestly quite a bit better than I was expecting it to be. For starters, the controls are actually really responsive, and the steering and drifting are a major upgrade from All-Star Fruit Racing. The gimmicky power-up system from that game's also been taken away in favor of a traditional power-up system. Though the game does suffer from clarity issues with certain power-ups, I still have no idea what these rotating burgers are supposed to do, because they're not a projectile weapon and they're not a shield. But going back to the positives, the game's also got a good sense of speed, with track design often allowing enough space to drift and build up speed. And while there's a very minimal amount of tracks, there are a few creative ideas at play with track locations, like a track made from Ryan's various toys in his room, or the Toy Store track. And on top of that, while yes, it's clearly made for kids, it's actually got a fair level of difficulty for kids. I found myself having to put in quite a bit of effort to win races on hard difficulty, which was a pleasant surprise. Now granted, this isn't to say it's all perfect. Beyond the power-up clarity issue and the minimal track lineup, the game is lacking in feedback in certain areas, particularly particle effects and sound effects. And speaking of sound, when playing single player, Ryan likes to throw in remarks quite a lot. Some are tips, like him reminding you how to use your power-up if you've been holding on to it for too long, which is a bit irritating, but compared to Chief and Monation Racers, it's quite tolerable. But sometimes a PNG of him will just slide onto the screen with a random quip. And this does get kind of annoying pretty quickly. Oh yeah! Yeah! Whoa! And then finally, there's the asking price. There's not a ton of content in this game, which isn't necessarily a problem, but in Canada, the game on the PS4 store cost $52. For comparison, that's around the same price as CTR Nitro Fueled, which has tons more content, not even counting all the stuff that was added for free after launch. Granted, yes, CTR does have a stricter learning curve than Race with Ryan, making it less beginner friendly, but still, $52 is a bit much for a game like this. With that said, all things considered, I was expecting worse, much worse, with this game. And I was honestly really surprised that it turned out to be alright. Now am I ever going to come back to this one in the future? No, probably not. But for a younger player just getting into the genre, this honestly isn't a terrible place to start, so long as you can find it at an affordable price. I'd still personally recommend something like CTR or Mario Kart over this, but I wouldn't actively tell someone to not get it like I would with Eminem's Kart Racing or Nickelodeon Kart Racers, which, for a game based off a child YouTuber, is probably the best outcome you're going to get. To end off this little marathon, I've got a kart racer here based off a 60s cartoon released on a SEGA console. 
Hitting some new ground here, I know. For a quick history lesson, back in the late 60s, Hanna-Barbera, the creators of Scooby-Doo, made a cartoon series known as Wacky Races. It only lasted 17 two-segment episodes, but it did have an impact within the Hanna-Barbera library, as its main antagonist, Dick Dastardly and Muttley, became arguably the most recognizable villain characters under the company's belt, to the point that Dastardly was the villain of that Scooby-Doo movie that came out earlier this year. Now, while I wasn't born for another three decades after the show started, I actually watched a lot of it growing up thanks to my uncle, who had the entire series on DVD, a cartoon about crazy car races? That was right up my alley. I promise that pun was unintentional. And it was the same uncle who introduced me to the Wacky Races game on one of the most underrated game consoles of them all, the Sega Dreamcast. Seriously, this piece of machinery was really cool, and in many ways kind of ahead of its time. But there's already plenty of YouTube videos dedicated to the Dreamcast, so I'll leave it at that. But yeah, we're gonna end this off with the Wacky Races game on Dreamcast, which I haven't played since I was really little. Now yes, there were other Wacky Races games both before and after, such as Wacky Races Crash and Dash on the Wii, which I owned, but I wanted to stick with the Wacky Races game I was familiar with. And I'd rather not play Crash and Dash ever again, that game was awful. So the Dreamcast game it is. So you start off with 8 of the show's 11 drivers available for use, with the other 3 being unlocked as you progress through the campaign. Unfortunately for me, the 3 locked characters happen to be 3 of my favorites from the show, Professor Pat Pending, Dastardly and Muttley, and the best wacky racer of all, the Red Max. Fortunately, the others are still solid characters, so I can be patient. The game's single player campaign takes an adventure mode structure, similar to that of CTR and Diddy Kong Racing. You drive around an open map of sorts towards racing challenges in themed areas, and winning in these challenges will grant you gold stars that unlock new tracks, challenges, and eventually boss races against the previously mentioned Pat Pending, Red Max, and Dastardly and Muttley. Even the challenges are very similar to the ones you'd see in Diddy Kong Racing and CTR. Time trials, Grand Prix, collecting a bunch of trinkets on the track before winning the race, the previously mentioned boss races. It follows these games' adventure mode formulas to a T. Which I mean, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And fortunately, Wacky Races still has its own ways to stand out from those games in its gameplay, namely with how power-ups are handled. See, Wacky Races doesn't actually use item boxes like most other kart racers. Instead, each driver has their own set of gadgets, tricks, and abilities, an element taken straight from the original cartoon. And before each race, you actually map each of those abilities to one of the Dreamcast's face buttons. To use your abilities, you need tokens which can be found all over the track. And once you have enough for an ability, you're able to spend them on that ability's usage. Now, while this seems like a really neat mechanic at first, I felt it was a bit arbitrary, since each character only has three abilities, meaning you're able to map them all. That is, until you realize that your first race against each boss unlocks a new ability for the character you're using. Each character has a maximum of six abilities, but you're only able to equip three per race. So there actually is strategy in choosing which abilities you want to bring along with you. So yeah, gonna be honest, I love this mechanic. It really changes the usual dynamic of gameplay and adds an extra layer of strategy with your choice of character and weaponry, and overall gives this game a nice sense of identity, one that fits with the source material no less. Which on a related note, this game has a nice bounciness to it, putting an emphasis on that cartoon aspect without it being detrimental to play, helped by the very responsive controls. Some characters are definitely better at some aspects than others, of course, but I wouldn't say there's any character that's not fun to use. Aside from maybe the gruesome twosome, their car size does block up a bit too much of the screen. On top of that, the game looks really nice. It goes for a simplistic art style with a hint of cell shading to match that cartoony look of the original show, and executes it pretty well. As for the audio though, I'm admittedly half and half. On one hand, the soundtrack is absolutely fantastic, but on the other hand, this game kinda has the same problem as Modation Racers, in that it doesn't know when to quiet down. Granted, it's not nearly as bad, but pretty much the entire cast is incredibly talkative, and if one of them ain't talking, the announcer is. It's a battle royale in this race. Oh, shut up. Now, despite all these elements that the game does solidly, there is one aspect that I think holds it back just a little bit, and that would be the difficulty because, jeez, this game gets brutal. This might be some of the stretchiest rubber band AI I've ever seen in a kart racer. And even when I won, more often than not, it'd be by less than a second. And that's before mentioning the boss races. Which on that note, while the Red Max is my favorite of the wacky racers, his boss fight especially is ridiculous. Since his car is also a plane, he's able to fly. So he doesn't slow down when going off-road. But he also spams his abilities till kingdom come, especially once you pass him. It only took me about 10 minutes worth of attempts to beat him, but it felt so much longer than that. And that was just the first challenge that I'll unlocks a new ability, I'd have to race him again later to unlock him.
Ah, but fortunately, I had an alternative way to unlock him. For you see, this game has cheat codes. Probably not the most credible call on my part as a reviewer, but with a game as hard as this, I could tell I wasn't going to be patient enough to unlock him normally. Alongside unlocking all the characters, there's also cheat codes to unlock all the tracks and challenges, all the character abilities, and even, for some reason, a hard mode. Which, from the race I did in hard mode, honestly didn't feel any harder than the regular difficulty. But yeah, I used this opportunity to unlock and play as the boss characters. And sure enough, playing as Red Max was great! No dirt nor water shall scare me now, for the Crimson Hay Baler shall not be stopped! So yeah, if you couldn't tell, I really enjoyed this game. It's definitely not perfect, but man, even despite its brutal difficulty, I had a lot of fun playing it. Unfortunately, it's not the most accessible game in the world, as beyond the Dreamcast, its only other release was exclusively in the UK on the PS2, but if you're somehow in a circumstance that allows you to play this, I would highly recommend doing so, especially if you're a fan of the original show. And with that, that brings us to the end of this second Obscure Kart Racer Marathon. To be honest, I do feel like this lineup was a bit weaker than the offerings from the first video overall, but at the very least, there were some solid titles present here, between Toy Story Racer and Wacky Races, coincidentally the oldest of all the games in this marathon. And Race with Ryan not being bad was a genuinely pleasant surprise. And the less I have to think about Nickelodeon Kart Racers ever again, the better. Though that said, I think I've had my fill with reviewing Kart Racers for now. 12 Kart Racers in the span of a few months? That itch has definitely been scratched enough. Won't stop me from looking at other sets of obscure games in the near future, though. It's honestly quite fun to give the lesser-known stuff a chance at the spotlight, even if it doesn't turn out to be good. But anyway, that's all I've got this time around. This has been Black Mage Maverick, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.